The defeat in the regional elections brought about immediate opposition, frustration and anger in Santo and Tanner. Jimmy Stevens led his Nagriamal Bushmen into the streets to threaten government supporters who were from other islands. The message was clear. You're foreigners. Leave Santo. Go back home or else. Standover tactics were used in Tanner as well. Trouble flared up again in February when Jimmy Stevens renamed Santo as the Republic of Vemirana and declared its separate independence. The following month, the government named the date of New Hebrides independence as July 30th, 1980. There were the usual delays before it was ratified, first by the British and later, with extreme reluctance, by the French. Independence was now a reality and acted as a catalyst for the dissidents who struck again in late May. Order was restored in Tanner by the British Police Mobile Unit, but this time a well-organised and well-armed group of Santo residents, mainly French citizens, allied with Jimmy Stevens, determined to force the separation of Santo. There was plenty of help and encouragement from outside the New Hebrides. The American-based Phoenix Foundation invested at least a quarter of a million dollars to supply Vemirana with a pirate radio and even its own passports, coinage and constitution. And we said, after election on 1979, we want to tell you too that Santo must be on Monsanto's hand. It means Santo must be staying in our custom. We vote, but doesn't matter who win the election. But we said, you go to Villa. Election for us, it's for Villa, because it's white man, white man material. But we say we stay in the custom. We want to stay under our custom. Santo, with all the island around Santo, must be stay with Nagriamel. And on 28, the custom said, no, it's a time now. We give three time warning. Nothing done, we take back our, our property down where the Walter Linnis government is. On May 28th, Jimmy Stevens declared himself president of Vemirana. Santo Town was firmly in rebel hands, and only the French government facilities and police were unaffected by the secessionists. They took Santo's airport and captured the district commissioner with some of his police and officials. Government employees were terrorized, their homes and offices sacked, the British prison emptied and English language schools closed. Rebels soon controlled all New Hebrides government services, the post office, radio and all forms of transport. Even the old American wartime airstrips were permanently blocked and patrolled against possible retaliation. The government declared a total blockade on Santo for all aircraft, shipping and communications. Over two and a half thousand people were evacuated from Santo by the New Hebrides and British governments. For some, it had been the second time in less than a year that they'd left their homes, possessions and animals behind. Britain and France were still responsible for law and order up to independence, but even so, the New Hebrides government made several attempts to negotiate. Most of their efforts even to meet the rebels were rejected and the chief negotiators, Barak Sopi and Salam Alissa, were turned back several times. We've been trying to land at the airport on Santo. Before we left, we had received word that they would give an answer at 2 o'clock for us to land. We went and flew over Santo for about half an hour. We asked for permission three or four times, but the reply we received was negative. At first, there were about three trucks blocking the runway, then later another ten trucks joined them. We repeated our request to land, but they said no. We will try again through the radio to contact Jimmy direct. If he wants to talk, as far as the government is concerned, we are willing to sit down. If they don't want to meet us, that's their business. But as far as the government is concerned, we would like to try again.